Good morning. Welcome to each one. It's good to have you in church this morning. If you're joining via live stream, we also offer you a warm welcome as we share in fellowship together. Briefly, some of the announcements. As normal, our BB meet on Tuesday and Friday evenings, the normal time. Then the midweek this week is a Zoom and concluding the good book uh, series on heaven. That will be at 8 p.m. on Wednesday. Next Sunday, we meet at normal time, Sunday School and Grid at 11. Service of worship, 12 noon. And God willing, we will look at Jonah chapter 4, beginning of that. Uh, PW ladies, note that your next meeting will be at 7.45 p.m. tomorrow night week, the 6th, with Carlin Mabin, uh, locally from Garva, coming with Christmas crafts. So that is on the 6th. Then the Akadui Rainbows and Brownies. Uh, they're hoping to begin uh, very soon, uh, the second of the night in the sports hall. And there's more details. We'll speak to Louise, or uh, you can look at either the Akadui Brownie Facebook page or the church Facebook page for that. You can fetch from Cross Gar meet next Sunday night and then on the following Saturday. And details will be given next week again of that for any in secondary school age. Uh, recent collections, there have been many. I want to acknowledge the generosity of our congregation. Uh, first of all, back in the October season, the harvest offering for the property funds amounted to 9,525. Operation Christmas Child, thank you for your generosity. 1,410 pound contributed uh, monetary, but then there was also 20 boxes that were filled. And there was another five bags of various items that were sent, so a significant amount. The P.W. Loose offering amounted to 1,050. And then you had the Earl Haig Fund there, also 149.51. And B.B. Enrollment last Sunday, 570. So quite a lot. You add all that together, that's a significant amount of money donated to all uh, this work. And we appreciate that very much. It's not finished because you've had your uh, Children's Society envelopes and today is the last uh, week to return them. And we know you've given generously in the past. And then also this morning, United Appeal envelopes are in the pews because we normally do that twice a year, uh, once in May time or so, and then again now towards the end of the year. So those are there and you can return them in the next couple of weeks as well. So thank you. Uh, for your generosity in past offerings, and we commend uh, these appeals again to you. Wider World is available in the John Davy Hall. Thank you to Elizabeth and Olga for arranging that. And it's alphabetical, so if you go in there afterwards, it's uh, set out alphabetically. Uh, then the Bible reading notes, thank you to John Wilkinson for looking after this. Uh, some have used it in the past. Existing orders will be uh, maintained, but if you want to change or start for the first time, well, then please speak to John about that. And it's very important that we read God's Word faithfully to learn uh, from him. So please note that. And God, our, those are all the announcements. Save, just to remind you, uh, you were probably informed on the way in that there's been a change in advice from the Presbyterian Church um, as of Friday evening. So as of Friday evening, up to now, we were wearing masks only to sing, and they've asked now that if you're over 13 that you wear masks all the time. So apologies if that's a shock to, to you. Um, it's because of the changing circumstances in society. Obviously, there's more COVID around, uh, unfortunately, there's new variants coming in as well. You will know that in wider society, there is the uh, possibility that covert passports will be needed uh, to go into venues for entertainment, uh, restaurants, clubs, etc., cinemas. And it is the strong desire of the Presbyterian Church that we don't arrive in a position where people have to show passports to come to worship. So in order for that not to be the case, it's important that we're seen to go the extra mile uh, as it were. So a face mask for the time being are to be worn not just for singing but for all of the service and that will be true for the immediate future uh, in Sunday morning. So thank you for your cooperation and understanding 
in that. We're going to be looking at Jonah, four to, or Jonah 3 today. We looked at it before uh, under the heading of God of Second Chances, speaking about how he worked with Noah. And that was primarily the first four verses. We're going to look at the theme of repentance today. The city of Nineveh repented and turned to God. And of course, we are told in Scripture that when we turn to God, he will receive us graciously. Whoever calls in the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, verse 13. Let's bow and seek God's blessing upon us. Father, we rejoice that we can come again this morning together as your people to worship you and to learn from you. We pray that we would know your blessing. We pray that you would challenge us from your word. And may you be exalted and glorified. For we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you to Ethne and to the folk on the desk again this morning and the choir who will lead us. And those who lead from the front are permitted to remove masks for that purpose. So we're going to begin by singing, All Heal the Power of Jesus' Name Before Him Angels Fall. And this is taken out of the new hymn book. So please uh, pay careful attention because it's slightly different uh, from the older version that you may know in your head. All heal the power of Jesus' name. Thank you to the choir.
Let's join in prayer. Let us pray. Father, it is our prayer that we will crown you Lord of all, because you alone are worthy. You are, you are the eternal God, who was and is and evermore shall be. You are the creator of all that has been created and the sustainer of all. And humbly we worship, praise, and adore you. We thank you that you're a God of power, but also a God of grace and mercy and love. And Lord, we thank you that when we respond in true repentance, you receive guilty sinners. And Lord, you make us your children. We come today to confess that often we have failed you. Often we have gone our own way. We have been stubborn. We've been willful and rebellious. We pray, Lord, that we would know your forgiveness. We pray that we would experience your grace, your mercy, and your amazing love. And we thank you that your grace is amazing. We thank you to reach out to those who do not deserve your love, and you welcome us. You love us, you cherish us, and day by day you guide us and you direct us. As we come today, we thank you that we can read your word together. We thank you for this book of Jonah that we've been studying. And Lord, we thank you that the last time we looked at it, we were reminded that you're a God who gives second chances to those who disobey you and run from your will. But as we continue to study today and look particularly at the topic of repentance, remind us indeed that we are unworthy sinners and we need to repent of our sin to know your salvation. And even as your children, we continually feel you. Lord, encourage us to be swift to acknowledge the wrong that we do, to repent of it, to turn away from it, and to seek your forgiveness and your renewal. We thank you for each head bowed before you, young and old alike this morning. And Lord, you know each need you know the concerns and anxieties that trouble us. We pray, Lord, that you'd reveal yourself in a very powerful way to each one, that by your Holy Spirit you will minister to us, you will encourage us and lift us up and point us again to the Savior. Help us today to turn our eyes to Jesus, to look full in his wonderful face. And Lord, as you do so, we know the things of this world will fade away. Help us to have that focus upon you and upon the things of eternal value. So, Lord, richly bless us, we pray. Lead us by your Spirit, and may we be aware of your touch. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to read Jonah chapter 3. If you want to turn the Pew Bible, it's 928, page 928. <clears throat> we read the first four verses uh, last time, thinking particularly about the call uh, to Jonah and his second chance. That was two weeks ago. We're going to read the entire chapter uh, this morning, this afternoon, I should say. Jonah chapter 3. This is God's word. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. No, 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 Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very important city. A visit required three days. On the first day, Jonah started into the city. He proclaimed, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overturned. The Ninevites believed God. They declared a fast, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose up from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Then he issued a proclamation in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let any man or beast, herd or flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let every man and beast be covered with sackcloth, that everyone call urgently on God. 
Let him give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring upon them the destruction he had threatened. Amen. And we know God will bless the reading of his truth. Okay, uh, good to see some children again this morning. Okay, very briefly I'm going to show you something and um, can you tell me who that is? Not his name in person. But what do you call that person in front? In this case is a pipe band. So what's his title? I'm going to ask the choir then if the children don't know. So what is he? He's the drum major. Okay. So I don't know what you call him, whether he's Jimmy or, or Willie or who he is, but that's the drum major. Okay, boys and girls, now it's a drum major. And what does he do? Well, he leads in front and he gives the instructions to the band to follow. If you wanted them to stop, well, he has that mace in his hand. Usually he might hold it above his head or he might shout something. What would he shout if he wanted them to stop? Four-letter word, beginning with H, halt. Okay, if he shouts halt and holds the mace above his head, hopefully they'll halt as well. And if he wants to, then if they're stopped for a period of time and he takes the mace down and points it forward, what's he telling them to do? Tell them to move off, isn't he? Or he might point it to the right or to the left. He gives instructions to halt, to move forward, to turn right, to turn left. But then they might want to go back and to turn round in the road, go back the direction they've come from. So what words would he shout? He'll probably shout two words. The second is turn. What was the one before that? About turn. If you're in BB, some of you boys don't march as much as you used to. But in BB, if you're marching and taking orders or GB or whatever, it's the same. So. The drum major might shout, about turn, and he will turn, and the band behind will turn. He will give direction. So it might be to halt, it might be to move forward, left or right, and sometimes it'll be necessary to go back, and that will be about turn, turn around, go in the opposite direction. That's a good illustration of what happened with the people of Nineveh. And we talk about repentance. The word is not here as such, but it's speaking about the people in Nineveh. They repented of their sin. And that means they turned round. And the next picture illustrates this. You will see two pictures here on the screen. Am I right? Path to sin and death. The one on this side. And you see, the Bible tells us when we're born, in our hearts we have sin, we inherit sin. We do things that are wrong, say things that are wrong, think things that are wrong. That's called sin. And if you like, we're heading away from God. We're heading on the path to death and to destruction. But then God in his mercy speaks to us. He calls us. He tells us that he loves us. And if we respond to his call and believe in Jesus, the one who died for us, if we're sorry for our sin, then God will forgive us. And see, that's what repentance is, because the other arrow says path to life in God, and that is turning round about turn and going in a completely different direction. And you see, that's what happened to the people of Nineveh. They were living sinful lives. They were very violent people, evil people. But Jonah shared God's message. And Jonah told them they would be destroyed because of their wickedness. But we can be sure that he told them more than that. And they came to understand that because of their sin, they would be destroyed. And so they knew they were in the path to ruin and to death. But as God spoke to them, they were sorry for the wrong that they had done. They turned away from it because we read here, they put on sackcloth. That means they were sorry for their sin. They fasted. And the king said also, let them give up their evil ways and their violence. In other words, they changed their attitudes and they changed their behavior. They turned away from their sin. And it's just like what we see on the sign. They were heading 
for ruin. But God spoke to them, and they turned round, and they headed in a different direction, no longer towards destruction, but towards God and salvation. And that's a picture of what repentance is. Just like the band about turn, we turn around, we go in a different direction, we're sorry for our sin, and we trust in Christ and seek to follow him. And see, the Bible tells us that we're all headed in the same direction at the start, towards ruin. We're all like that. And we need to hear God speaking to us as, he, as we read the Bible, as we listen in Sunday school, then BB, or in church, or wherever. As God speaks to us, he tells us that there's sin in our lives that we need to ask God to forgive. We need to turn to him. If we do, he will receive us. He will forgive us and make us a child of God. What is a Christian? What is a believer? What is a boy or girl, a young person or an adult who has realized they have sinned in their lives, have said sorry to God for their sin, have asked Jesus into their hearts to be their Savior? It's a person or a young person or child who has turned around and turned to God. And that's what God wants each one of us to do today. Let's pray to him for a moment. Father, we praise you and thank you, the great God that you are, but you're also a loving God. And when we turn from our sin, we know you will receive us and make us your child. Help us today to understand that there's sin in our lives, that we need to repent, we need to say sorry, and we need to turn away from that sin and turn to Jesus. May each one of us, young and old alike, do that this day. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing I'm special because God loves me. We can turn to God and repent as we trust in what Jesus has done for us, dying for us. We're going to sing this. The offering will be brought up and left in the communion table um, at this point. And then children, you're free to go to Children's Church after we conclude. I'm special. As we pray, we want to dedicate our 
offering this morning and give thanks for the money that's been given uh, towards the various projects recently. We also pray for our nation at this time, a time of uncertainty, that God will give clarity and wisdom and discernment to all our leaders and indeed also those within our own denomination. Last week, we had a special week of prayer. Um, the Christian Institute highlighted various issues of concern. There may be great concern about COVID, but we should have a greater concern about some of the moral decisions that have been made by our leaders and continue to pray for that. So let's pray for all our leaders. Let's pray for our health professionals at a time of great stress for our local hospital and GP and those working in nursing homes, etc. Let's come to God in prayer. Father, we thank that you have blessed us richly. Uh, we thank you for all the money that's been given recently to the special appeals for the work of PW, and the work of BB. We thank you for the good response to the Operation Christmas Child and for the help that will be to many less fortunate children. We thank you also for the offerings brought by your people today and ask, Lord, that this money will be used to glorify your name and extend your kingdom. We come today mindful of the uncertainty within our land because of growing numbers of COVID and because of the new variants that have been found throughout our world. But Lord, we thank you that you are sovereign over all. We thank you that you are the God who knows the end from the beginning. And Lord, we trust you. Help us not to be fearful, but Lord, to know that you are with us. You walk with us through the fire. You never abandon your children. We pray very particularly for our political leaders at a time where real discernment is needed. We pray that they would seek wisdom from you. We pray for Boris Johnson and for the leaders in Westminster. We pray for political leaders locally and storm out also. And especially we lift up before you the health minister, Robin Swan, that, Lord, each one will know your guiding hand upon them. Help them to make wise decisions. And we pray, Lord, that society will respond wisely to the decisions that are made, to the guidance that is given. And, Lord, we just pray for a decrease in the COVID at this time. We thank you, too, for scientists who have developed the vaccines that are currently being used. And we pray for them as they would continue to study uh, the new variants and seek to form and adapt the various vaccines. We pray today also for the chief medical officer and for those with uh, difficult decisions to be made in that regard. We do think also of our local hospital in Colerain. We pray for all who work in the causeway doctors, surgeons, nurses, and other members of staff and auxiliary staff, all who are involved in caring for the sick. We remember those who are in the hospital and some who have been released very recently, praying, Lord, for your protecting hand to rest upon them. We're mindful also of the threat to nursing homes, and we pray for those from this congregation of Akadui who are in nursing homes. We pray your protecting hand upon them, that you will watch over them, that you'll keep the COVID away from these homes, and especially those who are so vulnerable. And we just commit this situation to you. We continue to pray today for the work of this church. We thank you for the good numbers of the boys in the BB. and pray again your blessing upon them in the week that is ahead. We pray for the Sunday school. We pray for the work amongst the ladies and all the work that is ongoing. May your blessing be known. May you draw young people and children to yourself. And we pray in these days, as many hear your word, that there will be genuine repentance and turning to you. We thank you that we have the opportunity today again to study your word. And we ask as we return to it soon, that you'd open our hearts and minds. Open our ears that we will hear your voice and help us to respond as you desire. These things we pray in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Before we study together the Word of God, we're going to sing this Getty piece, 
Our sins are many. His mercy is more. Many years ago, when I was assistant in Hill Hall Presbyterian Church in Lisburn, I was visiting um, along with the minister. He was chaplain in, in the hospital there in Lisburn. One man had just finished reading a book by Dennis Lyle and Jonah, and he insisted I take it because uh, he was finished with it. Let me read you a little bit from it, uh, relating to Jonah chapter 3. And Dennis asked this question, or in fact, two questions. What would, we say, what would we say if a lone preacher from the West were to preach the gospel in Beijing and witness a mass revival, which issued in the conversion of the Chinese authorities and a director from the ruling hierarchy that abolished state, state atheism in favor of complete freedom for the worship of God and the preaching of Christ? Do you believe such a thing could happen? That was written in 2004, of course, China is becoming increasingly more powerful, but still very much opposed to the things of God. Now, Dennis Lyle adds this. That is a precise parallel to the impact of what happened in the ancient world when the people of Nineveh turned from their idolatry and heathenism to seek the living God. We've been looking at the book of Jonah. There are many miracles in that book. And some people will remember, understandably, the miracle of Jonah being swallowed alive by a great fish and remaining alive in the fish for three days. But the story of Jonah, as it says on the screen, is not about a great fish, but about a great God, because the greatest miracle is not Jonah being followed, swallowed and kept alive by a fish. The greatest miracle is what we read today, the conversion of all the people 
of Nineveh, every lost soul in Nineveh turned to God. It was a great city. Scholars estimate there were about 600,000 people, possibly closer to a million. So it was a large, large city. They were ripe for judgment. They were an idolatrous people. They were a violent people. And yet, by God's grace, they hear from Jonah, God's message, they repent. And every single person in Nineveh falls to their knees in true repentance. Now, you and I might think of the day of Pentecost as the greatest day of ingathering of precious souls. On that day, 3,000 were saved through the preaching of God's word. But in Jerusalem, there were 2 million people that day. It doesn't compare to Nineveh because every person in Nineveh, potentially close to a million, was saved. Every person repented and turned to God. One summary that I read of Jonah chapter 3 is this. Jonah presents Nineveh repents and God relents. The first part Jonah presents, well, we looked at that two weeks ago. He presented the gospel. He went there. He didn't say what he felt like saying. God said, go and tell them what I give you to say. It was a challenging message. Forty days and Nineveh will be overthrown, will be destroyed. It was a crucial message because they had time to respond And the good news is they did. They turned to God. Jonah presented the message. Nineveh repented. And then the final verses, God relented of judgment. But today we want to think particularly from verse 5 to the end of the chapter. And here we see the key ingredients of repentance. What is true repentance? Well, three things to be said. First of all, we see the elements of repentance here. Jonah shares the message. He does it boldly, faithfully. I'm sure he had concerns. He was a bit reluctant. He was a lot reluctant, but he went and he shared the message. He must have shared it, and there must have some trepidation and anxiety when he was finished. What would happen to him next? These were our barbaric people who were famous for killing people and torturing them for people suffering excruciating deaths at their hands, how would they respond? Would he suffer the same fate? Would he be brutally killed, tortured even? Or would he be mocked and ridiculed? What would happen? Well, what happened was that people turned to God. The response was absolutely amazing. The first thing we see in verse 5 is this. The people believed God. The people believed God. That's what you read in verse 5. It doesn't say they believed Jonah. Jonah was a messenger. It doesn't say they believed Jonah. They believed God. They heard God speaking through the prophet Jonah. And he was, of course, somewhat self-righteous. He didn't have any real love for them. But they heard God speaking through Jonah. And they believed God. That little phrase, they believed God, makes it clear that they personally trusted God. Theirs was the response of faith. The exact same phrase is used in Exodus 14 to describe Israel's response of faith to what God had done to release them from their Egyptian bondage. And also it's found in Genesis 15, 6 to describe Abraham's faith in God. These pagan people, these (coughs) violent, sinful people, heard God speak through the words of Jonah and they believed God. (coughs) Jonah, if you like, was merely their instrument. And when you think about it, the message he brought wasn't a deep intellectual message. It wasn't very eloquent. It was a strong, challenging message, but it crucially was God's message. And you see, what we're talking about here is a great spiritual awakening. But for any great spiritual awakening to happen, the first step is for the word of God to be shared faithfully. The eloquence of the speaker is never the issue because God's Spirit does the work. It is God who penetrates hearts. It was once told of Charles Spurgeon, he was at a venue, he was checking out the PA system beforehand, and he got up and with not great strength em- or emphasis, he quoted John 1.29, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now he wasn't preaching. He hadn't prayed before he stepped into the pulpit that God would use what he said. He was simply testing the amplification. But there was a janitor nearby who heard that verse. 
and God used it to touch him. He was convicted of his sin, and there and then, on the spot, he surrendered to Christ. Never underestimate God's word. God's word will not return unto him in void, but accomplish that which he desires. There is power in the word of God. The word of God must be shared and heard, and thereafter, the next step is to have faith. They believed God. And notice the text doesn't say they believed in God. They believed God. Many people in the community who don't go to church, you ask them, are they a Christian? And they say, yes, yeah, I believe in God. But you know, that's not true faith. Believing in God or believing God exists, that's not true faith. The people of Nineveh believed God. That means they took God at his word. They believed him in such a way that it changed their lives. It changed their behavior. Note the people believed God. And the people acted on that belief. Very importantly, the second part of verse 5, they believed God. And what do they do? They declare a fast and they put on sackcloth. Fasting and turning away from evil were results, was the result of their faith, not the cause of it. They believed God and these actions came as a result. You see, the word repentance isn't really in the passage, but it's not so much a word, it's something you do. These people did repentance. And they proved their repentance is genuine by radically changing their behavior privately and publicly. David Guzak writes, if repentance is anything, it's not business as usual. If repentance is anything, it's not business as usual. When repentance comes, something has to change. Something has to be different. In this case, they take off their normal clothes and put on sackcloth. And we know that's a thick, coarse, uh, coarse cloth, normally made from goat's hair. And display, wearing that was displaying a rejection of earthly comforts and pleasures. They believed God. They had faith. They act on that belief. But what's the third thing we notice? They turn away from their known sin. As verse 8 ends, this is the king speaking, let them give up their evil ways and their violence. You see, repentance means to change your mind and turn from your previous sinful actions. The king is speaking. Notice he doesn't even bother to try and prove to them that they are wicked. He simply says this, every one of us needs to turn away from our wicked ways, from our violence that were known so much for around the world. We need to change. In other words, he's saying in our language, let's repent, let's turn around, let's change our minds, let's change our lives. Here we have the elements of repentance. But the second thing is we have here stressed to us the extent of repentance. It involved every citizen. Note what it says in verse 5. They declared a fast, all of them, from the greatest to the least. From the greatest to the least. The next verse signals out, singles out the king. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. Now, they, remember, this is a monarch of a very powerful, very influential city. Nineveh is the head, the capital of the Syrians, the most powerful force in the world at that time. He's a man of high position, but he takes radical action. He's the king of a dominant world power. He's unrivaled in terms of bat on the battlefield. He's unaccustomed to doing anything other than giving orders. But here, here, he's submitting to God. As conviction grips the king's heart, he responds in a way that the people also did. He removes his royal robe. He adorns himself in sackcloth and sits in ashes. He's revealing his conviction over sin. See, God has touched him. He's been convicted of his sin, and he's humbling himself by getting off his throne. That's a symbol of power. He takes off his royal robes that speak about power and authority, and instead humbly covers himself in sackcloth. He's not sitting on the throne any longer. He's sitting in ashes and dust. So instead of issuing a proclamation condemning the prophet and those who believe in him, the king commands repentance throughout the entire land. The people, you see, are already fasting, 
But now the king orders more of the same. If refraining from eating weren't enough, the king decrees no one should even taste anything. As if refraining from tasting anything weren't enough, the king decrees that no one should even drink anything. And if it weren't enough for the people to restrain from eating and tasting and drinking, what else does he do? He applies these measures even to livestock, even orders sackcloth for all the beasts. Now, some interpreters understandably find great humor in the king's edict requiring that even the animals have sackcloth put on them and that they fast along with their owners. But what does this tell us? Well, it's telling us he's taking repentance seriously. It speaks about the seriousness so that all the animals along with all the humans, their lives are totally intertwined. And symbolically, this represents all of the population. Someone said it's like a visual aid. It's a visual aid. So everybody sees wherever they turn, humans and animals, prostrating themselves before God, all dressed in sackcloth, all grieving over their sin and the judgment to be upon them. The repentance involved every citizen. Not one was left out. And it was prompt and practical. We don't know, but we assume they repented straight away. There's certainly no hint that they waited until the 39th day. What did Jonah say? After 40 days, and Nineveh will be overthrown. But the people immediately, swiftly, promptly repent. Postponing repentance, you see, just invites divine judgment. They were not going to continue in their sinful ways for 39 days, and then at the last moment, the 39th day, repent. And you see, sometimes there are people who think we will live without God, and they hear the gospel and they say, well, sometime later, before my life is over, I might consider trusting in Christ. That's the wrong attitude. We shouldn't put it off. Paul says, Second Corinthians 6, verse 2, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. In other words, when God calls a person to repent, it's time, it's time then and there to repent. And this repentance is not half-hearted. They don't try to justify their sin or excuse their sin. They mourn over it. They're truly sorry for it. And crucially, they turn from it. And you see, genuine repentance is not merely an awareness of sin. It is more than that. It's not even a brokenness over sin. Real repentance requires abandonment of one's sinful deeds, Repentance turns from sin, as we saw with the children. It's an about turn. We turn from sin. We turn to God. Of course, we should be sorry for our sin. We should grieve over our sin. But repentance is not mere sorrow over sin. It's about forsaking sin. And to repent is to change, is to fight sin and instead pursue holiness. The king did this. And he called for all of Nineveh to do so as well. And indeed, they did. The repentance of the Ninevites was prompt, public, personal, and practical. So note the elements of true repentance. Note the extent of true repentance. And then as you go to the final two verses in chapter 3, note the effects of repentance. If you like the consequences of the people's repentance... Note in verse 9, the appeal of the king. The, appeal, the king says this, Who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn away his fierce anger that we will not perish. See, the king of Nineveh understands the dire situation for himself and for all of the people. They were in danger of divine judgment because of their sin and violence and evil. He hoped their display of genuine repentance would stay the anger and judgment of God, allowing them to live and not be destroyed. See, he knows the fate, their fate rests in God's hand, and he hopes that God will show mercy. We should understand and appreciate that he's not bargaining with God. He's not trying to make some deal with God. He and the people genuinely forsake their sin because it's the right thing to do. It's obeying God. But he knows that that doesn't suddenly mean that God has to be merciful to them. He said, who knows, God may. 
God may be merciful or God may not be merciful. You see, God is a God of second chances, as we saw in the opening four verses of this chapter when we studied it two weeks ago. But he doesn't have to be. And we shouldn't assume that God always will be. Think about Uzziah and the ark of the Lord in 2 Samuel 6. He stretched out his hand and was struck dead immediately because he touched the ark of the Lord. He'd been commanded not to do so. Think about Ananias and Sapphira in Acts chapter 5. They were struck dead for lying to God. See, God is in the habit of saving sinners, but we should never presume upon his mercy. We should never merely treat him as if it's his job to forgive us, no matter what. Note the appeal. Who knows? God may be merciful. And then as we read the final verse, we see the alteration because God indeed is merciful. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he had compassion and did not bring about the destruction he had threatened. Now, from a human point of view, it looks like God had changed his mind. And some critics of the Bible say, here's God. God's supposed to be immutable. Theological term that means he doesn't change. But here he is. God is changing his mind. It looks like that from a human point of view, but from a divine point of view, God is simply responding as he'd already proposed to the change in the Nevites' heart towards him, to the change in their behavior, to their repentance. The hand of judgment of God was stead, and God shows mercy rather than wrath. Although they are undeserving, God chooses to offer grace to them. And grace is always undeserved. Verse 10, as I say, is a problem for some critics. They say, well, does this not show that God changes his mind? He was going to destroy them, and now he's not. Well, the answer is yes and no. Does God change his mind? The answer is yes and no. In his character, the answer is no. He is holy and just and unchangeable. God cannot, never will tolerate sin. But in his mercy, the answer is yes, for he turns his face to any seeking sinner. The Bible says, draw near to me, and I will draw near to you. See, God relents of the punishment he said he would bring to Nineveh when they repented of the evil they had done. God didn't change his mind. The people changed their ways. The people changed their ways, and in response, God acted differently. F.B. Meyer gives a very useful illustration in this regard. On the screen, you see someone walking into or walking against the wind. So he explains that what happened this way. He says, if you're walking against a strong wind, the wind is opposing you, and you see the effort is taken to walk into the wind. It's opposing you. It's holding you back. But if you reverse and you go in the other direction, the wind's no longer opposing you. The wind is helping you. Now, the wind hasn't changed. You have changed your relation to the wind. And likewise, God hasn't changed here. But the Ninevites changed their direction. And it's the same for us. If we reverse our direction in regard to him, he's no longer against us, but he is with us and he is for us. And it's just like our merciful, loving God to forgive the people of Nineveh. He turned from judgment and he displayed wonderful grace and mercy towards them. Here we see the elements of repentance. We see the extent of repentance and the effects of repentance. But as I close, let me leave you some lessons and then ask a very important question. First of all, lessons. Three simple thoughts from this. If God is, a, God is a God of mercy, offering abundant grace to the undeserving. These people in Nineveh deserved only judgment. And we, because of our sin, deserve nothing but God's judgment. Because as we've been saying, our sins are many, but God's mercy is more. He is a merciful God who wants to forgive us our sin, who wants to save us. God is a God of mercy, offering abundant grace to the undeserving. Secondly, if the great city of Nineveh could be saved, 
No person is beyond hope. I read at the beginning from Dennis Lai, the book he'd written back in 2004, speaking about Beijing. If a lone preacher went to Beijing and the whole of the city would be saved, everyone turned to Christ and they would change their behavior. That's the equivalent to what we read about here in Nineveh. But surely this story should fill us with hope. If God could do this through a prophet who was reluctant, who was far from perfect, who didn't have a great heart of love for the Ninevites, God can save any nation, any people, any individual. No one is beyond hope. And that old hymn, To God Be the Glory, contains that lovely hymn, or at least it did in the old version, the vilest defender who truly believes that moment from Jesus a pardon receives. No one is beyond God's wonderful grace and mercy. God is a God of mercy. Nineveh could be saved, so any person can be saved. Third thought, repentance is more than remorse, more than regret. We might regret sin. We might be sorry for it, but it's more than that. It's even more than resolving to change. Sometimes we can resolve to change. It's more. Repentance is a change of mind, which results in a change of heart, which results in a change of action. That is true repentance. But finally, let me leave you this question. Who needs to repent? We're thinking about the Ninevites, the people of Nineveh, from the greatest to the least. Amazingly, they all repented. Who needs to repent? Well, the Bible tells us the unsaved person needs to repent to experience the grace and mercy of God. Very simply, if you're here today and have never bowed the knee and asked Christ to be your Savior, you need to repent. You need to say sorry for the sin in your life. You need to ask Christ to forgive you and to come into your life. And that means repenting, turning around, going in a different direction. All who are unsaved need to repent. And God calls us to repent now, not to wait. The Ninevites didn't wait until the 39th day. If God speaks to you, if God convicts you of the sin in your life, repent and receive his mercy. But there's a second truth that is important. Christians need to repent to experience God's blessing. All of us who have trusted Christ as our Savior, we know that we feel him continually. We do things that grieve him, that hurt him. We need to repent and seek his forgiveness. We've been thinking about our land, praying for it. There are many concerns and challenges morally, particularly. The answer is Second Chronicles 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name, in other words, Christians, if Christians will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, that's repentance. Christians humbling themselves, praying to God, repenting of their wrong attitudes and behavior. If they do that, I will hear from heaven, says God. I will forgive their sin. I will heal their land. That's the greatest need. There's a lot of talk about Brexit protocol, a lot of time expended on news bulletins because of COVID, understandably so. But the greatest need of Northern Ireland, the greatest need of our land is a spiritual need. And the answer is for Christians to turn away from sin, to seek God, to pray faithfully, and God will pour out his spirit upon our land again. Let's bow in prayer as we close. Father, we thank you for this wonderful passage. We thank you for the reminder that you're a God of mercy, a God of grace. We thank that the Ninevites turned in true repentance to you. And we thank you that we can know that any person can be saved. We pray for any today who have never bowed the knee and asked Christ to be their Savior, that, Lord, you will remind them of their need of Jesus that you will remind them of your amazing love, that you want to draw near to them, you want to forgive them their sin, you want to make them your child. We pray, Lord, that they would not put off that decision, but reach out to you today and accept your offer of salvation. And for those who know Christ as Savior, Lord, continue to challenge us that we indeed would be people who will humble ourselves and pray people who will seek your face, and people who in repentance 
and sorrow will turn from our wicked ways. And Lord, in response, we know you will forgive us and we know that you will heal our land. We pray, Lord, today for revival among your people and we pray for a great spiritual awakening amongst those who are lost in sin. Lord, hear our cry, we pray, for the glory of Christ's name. Amen. As we close, it's very appropriate we sing the well-known hymn, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. It is by God's grace alone that we can know salvation. Amazing Grace. For the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and fellowship of the Holy Spirit, rest and remain with each one this day and forevermore. Amen.